All right, it's 4.15. We made it to our start time. Um, so this next case is a case of lingual squamous cell carcinoma that was presented to us um, as an appetence. And so the reason I wanted to bring this case forward is not because we see this a lot. Um, we don't. I've, this, was, this case was the first case that I saw, and then I went looking through our um, medical records system to see how many other cases that we had seen. I um, mean, this uh, publication is going to come out uh, hopefully in the next year. So we had um, one other horse, and I don't even know how many years at Auburn, that had uh, lingual or glossal squamous cell carcinoma. And that horse was actually treated with radiation therapy um, and had an extended, sort of an extended, um, I don't know, performance period, I guess is probably the best way to describe it. It was a breeding stallion. So they needed him to get through one more breeding season. And the radiation therapy actually really helped that horse and was kind of palliative radiation um, and made him feel a lot better. He was able to eat and that kind of thing. But it was sort of new to me. And I guess when you go and you look at all the um, literature about things that happen in the mouth, everybody always says, yeah, sure, the horses get squamous all of the tongue. There's no publications about it, not one. No case report, nothing, of anybody describing squamous cell carcinoma on the horse's tongue, which I find really weird um, because I have talked to several people and I'm not the only person who's seen it. So this mare was um, a buckskin mare, quarter horse mare. She was about 12 years old and she was presented to us for an appetence. And so the owner had reported that she wasn't eating for about two weeks um, prior to her referral. Then she also had a significant amount of weight loss, which appropriately was probably attributed to her you know, being completely inappetent. So uh, kind of going back to our weight loss talk um, last hour, you know, this horse would fall into the category of, you know, weight loss with no appetite. And those horses sort of, you know, those always make sense. They're not eating, um, don't always know why, but that makes sense that they're losing weight. So the weight loss was attributed to that, you know, inappetence. So, our DVM looked at the horse, the you know, owner called the RDVM, and he's, you know, one of our best referrings, went out, looked at the horse, did an oral exam, kind of just standard oral exam with the mouth speculum, and couldn't see anything um, visually wrong with the mouth. He did a, a dentistry, um, you know, floated the enamel points, and then palpated the tongue. And when he palpated the tongue, he could feel what he described as a ridge in the kind of most caudal aspect of the tongue. And so my experience in practice, I had more horses with tongue lacerations and weird things sort of lodged in the back of the tongue. I had a horse that had a needle in the back of the tongue once um, that wasn't eating. Um, it was a farm that they were doing injections to some other horse, like penicillin injections. So one of the needles must have somehow come off. The horse ate the needle. The needle lodged in the base of the tongue. Um, I've had them have weird shrapnel, you know, in the back of the, you know, lodged in the tongue. And it's often kind of at the caudal part of the tongue. Um, had a horse take its tongue almost off. Um, so when he called about it to say, you know, I've got this weird case and I feel this sort of thing in the back. I'm assuming this is a laceration. I was like, well, you know, it makes sense. That's um, weirdly horses lacerate the tongue. So um, he, you know, like I said, felt this sort of abnormality and thought, well, you know, if this is a laceration, I probably need to rinse the mouth out, treat the horse with systemic antibiotics in case it's probably got a secondary bacterial infection associated with the laceration, put the horse on anti-inflammatory, so probably banamine or bute, um, NSAID therapy to help with pain and the inflammation associated with that. And he watched the horse for like maybe seven days, I think, at that point before he called to say, you know what, this horse isn't any better. The owner has reported the horse is still not eating at all. Um, and I had recommended at that time that he take a radiograph because, you know, the first time I talked to him, because the, you know, this history of me having horses with metal in their mouth, you can easily see on a lateral radiograph of the horse a metal foreign body. Um, and so he had done that and didn't see any metal foreign body. So I was like, okay, um, why don't you send the horse in and we can get an endoscopic exam of the mouth. Um, and go from there. So the horse was referred for further evaluation. And on physical exam, she was really dull, like just didn't look good at all, had um, poor body condition. You know, TPR is essentially normal. She had GI sounds. Um, 
she had, you know, wasn't dysphagic, you, you could um, move her tongue, or she could move her tongue, um, she could hold her jaw closed, there wasn't any neurologic dysfunction that be misinterpreted as dysphagia, that she wasn't eating because she was dysphagic, um, she was able to swallow, um, so we didn't um, identify any of those Abnormality. So just an oral exam without a speculum, we're kind of doing the like hold the tongue over, look in there situation, couldn't see anything. That was abnormal. The most distal aspect of the tongue was perfectly normal. You could easily grab the tongue out the side of the mouth, look at the tongue, all of that um, looked fine. She was disinterested in food, so I couldn't really tell at all. Like I couldn't put food in front of her and tell, can she, you know, prehend the food and swallow and all of that, um, which is always difficult when you have a horse that you're trying to judge, um, you know, can they swallow, all of that. Um, but you could kind of press on her trachea, I mean, press on her, um, you know, pharyngeal area, and she'd swallow. So we did do an oral exam, and you, you know, I think pretty much anybody these days is going to have a, a mouth speculum to do dentistry work on a horse. You just can't, with the technology and stuff that we have and the expectations that our owners have, you can't really get a, a a good oral exam by any means in my mind without having a, horse, a you know, full mouth speculum on. Um, so we did that and you could, well, let me actually stop. I'll tell you what we saw in a second. So one of the other things I want to point out to uh, visualize the mouth is a dental scope. So at the time that we did this horse's exam, we did not have a dedicated dental scope. I was planning to use our flexible endoscope to just look and drive around and all that, which is what I did, and you'll see the images from that. Um, the other day, Dr. Caldwell, who is going to speak um, tomorrow and Wednesday, so if you see him, he's this is him, actually. He loves doing dentistry, and he just got us a um, dental scope, which that's really cool. So if you do a ton of dentistry in your practice, it... The first time I used it the other day and could see all the crowns and stuff, I was like, this is awesome. Like, I feel like I'm going to have to do this on every case now. Um, but that scope would also easily allow you in a field scenario to really get a good look at the tongue and all in the back of the mouth and all that. What you can't see just from looking in, even with a dental scope, I mean, uh, mouth speculum on. So this is basically what you normally can see, right? So you get your teeth and you can see your tongue, but you really can't see that back part very easily. Um, and then this is our horse. So this is the hard palate here, soft palate here. And then you can see this very large proliferative mass. And this is with just our flexible endoscope um, in the mouth. So saw that and thought, okay, well, that's not normal. But it could just be granulation tissue. Maybe we're still in this scenario like the referring veterinarian um, recognized, thinking that this was a laceration and we have a large amount of granulation tissue around the laceration. Um, or if there's some other type of, you know, maybe a plant foreign body that's lodged in the tongue and you have, um, you know, a granulation tissue surrounding that. Um, so our intent was to continue to fully examine the rest of the mouth, but also to biopsy that. And when I do biopsies on things in the mouth, um, because we can have the speculum and trying to use like little pincher biopsies that we would use with the endoscope, those are tiny and pointless. I'll go and use that big um, uterine biopsy instrument as I described with the rectal mucosal biopsies. We'll use that on these and you can get a pretty big chunk. They bleed, um, but you get a pretty big chunk with those. So this was the interesting part about this case. So we start scoping around and then we find this stick, thorns, everywhere and it's stuck there. So I thought, yahoo, we found it. So there's some stick in here and it's caused something in the tongue and we got this. And we you know, spent some time, we yanked that thing out. And of course on the scope, that looks huge, right? <laughs> it came out and it was, you know, like this big. And I thought, well, that's disappointing. It doesn't really seem like that's our problem, but it seems like a thorny stick stuck in the back of the mouth can't be a good thing. So we removed that, started looking around see still that the, obviously this mass is here. Um, so we did go ahead and take the biopsy. So I did not make the assumption that that was our only problem. I just was hopeful, I guess, that from a prognostic standpoint, maybe we had this stick and there was some other plant material maybe at the, you know, buried in the tongue or something. So our differentials for a mass like that, so is our, let me kind of go forward one, this thing that I was talking about in the last hour, Chang, so cyst, hematoma, abscess, neoplasia, granuloma, and these things being the most um, likely, with trauma sort of falls into this granuloma 
category too, but maybe this is just you know proliferative granulation tissue um, from a laceration to the tongue, like I said before, a metal foreign body, that kind of thing. So I wanted to take skull radiographs again and you know potentially try to characterize this mass because the referring veterinarian was really just looking for metal. Um, and all of us have looked at skull radiographs before. They're not easy, um, especially in a field scenario where you're trying to be like, is that, what is that, where does that line go? Um, I find them difficult to interpret sometimes. So um, I wanted to, to do that. And I think that's easily, um, as I mentioned before, something you can do in the field. You can do ultrasonography of the tongue. And I think that this is difficult, technically difficult. You can do intermandibular um, ultrasonography. And this takes practice. So this is not something where I would say, um, you know, hey, it's super easy on a full. Go put your ultrasound on the chest. You can see fluid in the chest. That's, that's a real easy thing to do with ultrasound. Trying to ultrasound the tongue is a little takes a little bit more technical expertise or practice with that. But you can do it. So you go in between the um, mandible and you know look at the tongue that way, try and identify any abnormalities. Um, you can do fine needle aspirates as well. When they're, it's that deep, that's difficult. Um, but you can get in there with a, a spinal needle sometimes and do aspirates um, that way, um, where you have more hand room, sort of more at the rostral end of the mouth. But I think the easiest thing to do is biopsy it with the big um, uterine biopsy instrument. And then at our hospital, we have um, some advanced imaging things that we can do. So we have a standing CT machine. So the horses don't have to be anesthetized to have a standing or to have a head CT at our hospital, which is very cool. Um, and we can get, you know, kind of characterize masses and things in the head and uh, dental abnormalities and that kind of stuff. And then, you know, if we need to anesthetize them, we can do a, a, a CT or an MRI. But this was kind of well off the radar for this owner. So um, the other thing that I put up kind of here on this little post-it is when you think you have a mass and you have the potential for that to be neoplasia, it's absolutely within reason to go ahead and do um, aspirates of the regional lymph nodes to see if that is a neoplastic mass that's spread, the same way you would do in a dog. So um, as I mentioned before, we use our uterine biopsy instrument, and I collect multiple samples. So I do a sample for histopathology, I do a sample for culture, and I do a sample for cytology. So I will frequently take the cytology sample first and you know, make impression smears of it, and then I drop that one in the formalin. The pathologists don't like it because that one's been crushed basically by me trying to um, either roll it on the um, slide or kind of smash it onto the slide to get enough, um, hi, en enough cellular um, infiltrate on the slide. And then I'll take another one for culture. The mouth, this is kind of a, a super um, contaminated area, as you can imagine. So yesterday, for those of you who are, are list were listening to Dr. Hepburn's talk in, um, about gastroscopy, you can take a pinch of the stuff off the top. So you take your instrument, pinch all the sort of fibrony, um, you know, crusty stuff on the top of the mass take that out and discard it and then go right back to where you were and you can get a better sample. And that works actually for all of these techniques, but works really well for the culture part too, because you can kind of, not that your instrument's not contaminated, it is, um, but you can get that kind of trash off and then get a better sample. Does that make sense? Um, so you're basically biopsying in the same area where you don't have that sort of crust of inflammatory debris. Um, so we do those samples and submit for all of those, hoping that that information will be valuable. So this horse um, came back. That is a long process to say it had squamous cell carcinoma. Um, and I was disappointed, actually, for this horse, of course, because there's not much we can do in that location. So you go back and you look at where this was. I mean, that's as far back. We're at the at the level of the soft palate. So you're as far back as you could go on the most you know, caudal aspect of the tongue at the base, and I can't do anything for that. Now, if this was a lingual squamous cell carcinoma on the tip of the tongue, lop it off. No problem. So whether or not there'll be a metastasis of that, you've got to you know, do a med check, check the regional lymph nodes, that kind of thing, because none of us know what the metastasis rate of squamous cell carcinoma from the tongue or mouth would be in a horse. Um, but you can absolutely um, amputate the distal part of the tongue and the horses can still eat fine and all of that. So, um, but this location, there's nothing really we can do from a surgical resection standpoint. You could potentially go in there and resect this, um, debulk it, I guess, not fully take the tumor out, but debulk it. Um, 
but chances that that helping the horse's you know, primary chief complaint of inappetence um, is pretty low. So this horse um, uh, ended up being euthanized. We did offer them to have radiation therapy. So we have a linear accelerator at Auburn and can do um, uh, LINAC for them. So um, it's palliative. It's very expensive, so they're usually getting, you know, anesthetized three times a week for four weeks, and that usually comes out to be ten or twelve thousand dollars. And so, for a, um, you know, somebody who can afford it and wants the palliative therapy, maybe that can be helpful. But considering it's not curative, most owners are not going to want to do that. And then this horse wasn't eating; I mean, it was in very bad shape. And so, asking the horse to be anesthetized three times a week for four weeks on the hope that maybe the horse is going to feel better and want to eat. Uh, it's not going to happen. So um, we did not elect to do that. You can also try um, intralesional chemotherapy. So Dr. Caldwell, um, his recommendation would be carboplatin in a case like that. Um, again, probably not going to do much from the standpoint of helping this horse clinically. So this is her at necropsy. And so you can feel here or see here probably that the ridge area that the vet was probably palpating that he could feel this ridge, which is, you know, he interpreted as a laceration, you know, appropriately, I think. But that um, tumor extended, you know, as, as far at the tongue as you can go. Um, so nothing really that we could have done for that. Um, unfortunate, uh, certainly for her. No evidence of metastasis. I will say that necropsy didn't find any evidence of metastasis. Um, so that's good, just sort of um, kind of anecdotal evidence that maybe that is doesn't have a high rate of metastasis. Um, so the kind of take home point of this is while this is uncommon, I would recommend that every time you're doing an oral exam, same way, I was just at the dentist the other day and my dentist grabbed my tongue, flipped it all over, like they're looking in our mouths for lesions like that as well. We should be doing that in our oral exams on these horses because maybe on a standard dentist or standard oral exam in preparation for a dentistry, maybe that's something that could have been seen a little earlier. And especially now with the, you know, availability of, you know, dental and oral endoscopy that's so easy in practice, maybe these things will be caught um, really early and we can do something about it. All right, any questions about that one? Sure. So from a cause, that is just a, a mutation. So a neoplastic mutation, um, because that location, you know, like in humans, we'll get squamous cell carcinoma from sun damage and things like that. So that's in that location, it's not going to happen. So that's a, a neoplastic mutation that's happening at the level of the tongue. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, on the tongue. Or, wow. 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 So the comment was that he sees those a lot in Belgian horses, which reminds me back to your comment earlier about um, the Belgian horses that choke, um, hopefully not squamous cell carcinoma. Um, so well, that's interesting. You know, it's weird. I'll have to ask about that. We have a population of 200 Belgian and Percheron horses um, associated with our university. I'm going to have to ask them to see if they have recognized that as well. And they're all geriatric. So there are horses that are Belgians that are all in their 20s to 30. So that's interesting. I've seen them from Third Island. I just saw them a couple days ago. Yeah. Oh, wow. So the comment was seeing them on the squamous cell carcinomas on the third eyelid, but in a horse that's a year of age. And that, that's, yeah, really uncharacteristic. Yeah, that, I'd say... Um, ocular squamous cell carcinoma, we, probably not a week goes by that one of those doesn't come into our opto service. They're seeing those near constantly, but um, yeah, that's young. Any other questions? Yeah. She had definitely wasn't playing with her tongue. She had some mild salivation. So like she'd go and she'd be normal, but then when you sort of started messing with her and stuff and she'd start moving her mouth around, um, which is what made us um, really diligent about making sure she could swallow. Because when she started with that, it was a little like, because most of the time when I see stuff, it's coming to me because it's neurologic and dysphagic. So I, you know, as an internist, so I thought, okay, I got to make sure that this isn't like underlying, some underlying dysphagic thing. Um, and we all had gloves on because I thought, oh God, it's probably going to have rabies with my luck. Um, so um, 
yeah, and then we found this. So this was a unique thing for me that I had, you know, certainly read about, because like I said, it's in textbooks. People say it all the time, but like I said, not one published report of squamous cell carcinoma in the tongue in a horse. So weird. So keep it in mind. All right, and I'll pull up our last thing here.